Good afternoon. We've, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a project that uh, my team, my, the group and my collaborators are involved with around actually trying to develop an automated phenotyping system. We've heard several talks about it over the course of the day and, and that are talking about specific components. I was trying to focus in on, with this particular talk on the last component, which is how does it relate to genetics and genetic enhancement. So that's the sort of the transition I'm going to make here. But I'm also going to try to draw a larger uh, a picture of what this project actually entails. So one of the things, so I'm a life scientist. I'm interested in genetics and genes and genetic resources and adaptation of plants to climate variability and things of that nature. And one of the things that's happened in the last uh, 15 years is genomics has totally changed the landscape of how we do uh, genetic science. Uh, in this picture in the, uh, in the top left, those are different varieties of sorghum collected from different parts of the world. They have different botanical characteristics. They represent different races. And so I could take these different, re these different races or these different accessions, isolate the DNA, send them to the core sequencing facility on campus, and for about $400, I can get 780 or 730 million base pairs of DNA back in terms of their sequence. So for roughly $400, I can understand all of the genetic material in these, uh, in these different accessions. And I can use that information to try to draw inference about what's the relatedness of these different accessions. I can use that information to, for example, compare what's happening in sorghum with what's happening in, in rice or corn or potato or humans or mouse using uh, databases where those sequences are stored. Depending on the hypotheses that come out of that type of analysis, I might request genetic resources where I knock out genes and test the effects of those mutants to try to verify gene function. So in genomics, the state of the art is big data. So for, for $400, I can get 730 million base pairs of DNA. We've talked about phenomics. So phenomics is the study of plant characteristics or traits. Traditional phenotyping is very, very expensive. So for example, I develop a new sorghum variety and I submit it for testing to the Purdue testing program. For $325, just a little less than what I spend for sequencing, I can test the variety in four locations and they'll send me about three or four data points for each location. So I'll have maybe 15 data points for $325 or 730 million data points for $400. So there's a problem, there's a challenge trying to link those two things up. And the kind of data that I might get would include data collected by people walking around the field with little instruments or analyses of the grain or analysis of plant growth and development characteristics. So clearly bottlenecks in our ability to collect high resolution phenotypic data limit our ability to bring those two data sets together. Large genetic data sets, very small phenotypic data sets. And so a number of institutions over the last few years have been investing in a research platform or platforms that allow the scientists to do phenomics in new sorts of ways. And so in a couple weeks, actually I think two weeks from tomorrow, Purdue is going to be opening up something called the Indiana Corn and Soybean Innovation Center, a 25,000 square foot automated phenotyping research laboratory. And the intent of the facility is to develop large and small field robots, to develop UAV, UAV data collection systems, to develop sensors that can be used to look at water, plant, and soil characteristics. And so with that development, we're looking at what's the state of the art. What we're hoping moving for forward is that this is massive data, and, and data in, the, in terms of size, similar to what is available to geneticists. And so we have a project that was funded by <clears throat> the ARPA-E program, the ARPA-E Terra program of DOE. And it's called Automated Sorghum Field Phenotyping and Trait Development. And the objective is to develop these remote, these essentially the remote sensing platforms or automated phenotyping platforms. And we're looking at two different types, ground-based or sort of wheeled platforms, robot-based platforms, and UAV-based platforms. If you look at the picture on the right, you have an idea, you can get an idea. Those are three different types of sorghum that would be represented, sort of the phenological variation that's represented in this crop. Those little ones on the bottom left, those would be grain sorghum types, about a meter tall. The two t larger ones in the back represent either Sudan, sorghum Sudan hybrids, or, or biomass type hybrids. So one of, the, one of the things that I'm most excited about this project is that we were able to develop a team that's really transdisciplinary. So in this team, 
We have folks, if you look at the list on the right, and these are essentially the, the co-authors on this paper, we have people from the College of Engineering at Purdue, and the people coming out of the College of Engineering represent information technology, remote sensing, uh, sensing analysis, data acquisition, the typical types of engineering and computer science expertise. And they're not just any old faculty members. We have leaders in, in, the, in the field coming out of the College of Engineering. We also reached into the College of Technology, and so we have specifically reaching out to aviation technology because there's a lot of challenges with collecting this type of information from these UAV platforms. And then we have plant scientists coming from the College of Agriculture. And we also collaborate with IBM. And so IBM, we have a number of scientists, several of them here, uh, bringing in expertise in machine learning, data mining, data analysis, analytics. And we have the last subgroup of our team represents crop modeling. And the crop modeler on our team is from Australia, from CSIRO. And so it's really this, this really incredibly diverse uh, group of scientists representing these different disciplines allowing us to sit down together on a relatively frequent basis and have discussions about how do we move this project forward. But all of the science is being done out in the world. So it's out in uh, farmers' fields where we have field trials and ground validation studies, people walking around in fields, plants growing depending on a lot of water or not enough water, uh, living in a, in a competitive environment. And so these, we're collecting data in these natural environments for our ground validation uh, studies. And so there's two major studies. There's the calibration experiments, where we grow a variety of different types of sorghum, collect a lot of ground data. So for example, that might include this panel down here in the bottom left, where we have, I think the last time we did this experiment, there were 18 people, most of them with PhDs, running around harvesting plants, bringing them to campus, uh, bringing them to the, to the phenotyping platform and characterizing them for lots of traits. So that ground validation data, the ground truthing data, is largely data collected by hand. In terms of the phenomobile, that's one of the types of platforms that we're working with. It's actually a commercial spray chassis. And we're using the boom, a customized boom, with sensors mounted on them to collect data as it moves over the top of the crop. The UAVs, we have both commercial off-the-shelf type uh, platforms as well as specialized platforms. This is a picture of Evan with a customized platform that was designed to try to fly as slow as possible to be optimized for the type of payload that we're, uh, we're carrying. What types of traits and data are we collecting? Some of them are obvious ones. We've talked about them, stem diameter, plant height, leaf size and shape, et cetera. We're looking at physiological traits, such as canopy temperature and chlorophyll content, nitrogen use, derived traits, many of them related to plant growth and development related to vegetation indices. And we're actually harvesting tissue from all of these plant, uh, from plants representing all of these plots to look at their molecular or their biochemical characteristics as well. And they were being evaluated with multispectral, hyperspectral, LIDAR, thermal IR uh, types of sensors. So we've heard people talk a couple of different presentations today about uh, analyzing the data, processing the data, and analyzing the data for different types of features. But one of, the one of the key components of this particular project is it starts with germplasm resources for sorghum. We're querying those germplasm resources for their traits using remote sensing as well as data collected by hand, processing that data image to predict what types of traits we have, and then going back to the genetic resource to find out where are the genes and what are they doing. And so some of the challenges that we've talked about today include camera calibration and image correction, identifying the plots inside of the field space as well as the plants inside of those plots for looking at and predicting traits. By having properly georeferenced materials or imagery, we can actually look at time course series. And so we can look at the same plants growing at different time points and being evaluated with different types of sensing technologies. And ultimately, coming back to the fact that we have genetic resources growing in field environments and, uh, and the desire being to try to identify genes that contribute to improved performance. And a lot of this, what does it mean to be improved performance? We're talking in the, this particular project about biofuels care, uh, functionality for those types of systems. And so we're developing an understanding of the natural variation for these traits, as well as, for example, here on the right, we've identified over 25 mutants that have modified uh, biochemic, biochemical characteristics that make it easier to extract biofuels from these types of plant materials. 
And we're even developing plants, or we're developing plant types that have modified metabolism so that they're, they are more efficient uh, in terms of their processing with regards to their compatibility with these uh, fermentation types of systems. So all in all, this is a project that's really, we've talked about different pieces of it at different times today, but it's a, it's a large project that requires interaction amongst the different team players, both different multidisciplinary groups at a single in institution like Purdue, but also reaching out to our collaborators in the private sector and at other institutions. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I said when I started talking this morning was I was excited to have an opportunity to come talk to you today was again about trying to reach out and look for opportunities for synergism and look for opportunities to push this research forward. The field that you have used, have you controlled the water? Is this natural water in there? This is, uh, we call it the Eastern Corn Belt, so it rains a lot, I and mean, it's a natural irrigation, it's essentially naturally watered. So there's no stress in water in there? There's no drought stress in Indiana because of the location where we're growing them. Any other questions on this? All right, so let me ask you one looking ahead for the panel. So there are a lot of data science techniques around, and you know, you're working with some really good, good groups. But what are the pain points? I mean, where did you find deficiencies? Deficiencies? Yep. I mean, where does data science <laughs> get stressed? Uh, actually, that's an interesting question. I, um, so as a life scientist, I think my, I understand my own area of science, and I think you know, biology is relatively straightforward. And I look sometimes to my, science, my collaborators in the data science end, and I think, wow, that looks like magic, some of the things that they're doing. And it takes me a while to get up to speed with the type of work that they're doing and the, and the type of uh, semantics that they're using to describe their work. And I thought my science was easy and theirs was challenging, but as we sit down and we have opportunities to engage, I'm a little surprised to find that they think that the biology is confusing or complicated and the data science is easy. So I think the single largest issue has been uh, having, having enough time to sit down and have long conversations about what the issues are and how we can work together. Let's thank the speaker one more time. Right.